HR Break Room is brought to you by Paycom, empowering employees nationwide with HR and payroll tech in one easy app. Learn how Paycom simplifies business for your entire workforce at Paycom.com. Hey there, welcome on into the HR Break Room, Paycom's podcast dedicated to having quick conversations on the hot topics in HR. I'm your host, Morgan Beard, and in today's episode, we'll be speaking with Tiffany McGowan, Paycom's Vice President of Talent Acquisition, and Jennifer Matthew, Manager of Technical Recruiting and Strategy. We'll be chatting with them about, well, their titles give it away, talent acquisition and how the dynamic has changed in this highly competitive market. We'll look at both the employer and candidate perspective and discuss what's important for each and much more. And with that, let's step into the HR break room. All right, Tiffany, Jennifer, we are here in the HR break room. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Doing Thanks great. for having us. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And normally I have one guest and I kind of give the background. I, I said in the intro, I gave you guys his titles, but I want you guys to take the floor. Tiffany, if you want to start, kind of tell the audience kind of what you do, what brought you here, and uh, a little more about yourself. Sure. Well, I've been with Paycom 11 years, and in my personal opinion, I have the best job because my team gets to change the lives of individuals each and every day by Mm -hmm. inviting them to be part of the team. But I get to build the strategy coast to coast for Paycom on how we acquire top talent. Oh, wow. Okay. Jennifer, what about you? Um, So I've been on the team for eight years and have had the honor of working for Tiffany. Um, I have 15 years of HR experience under my belt, but primary function within that was recruiting. So right now I have the opportunity to specifically focus on tech recruiting, bringing the best and brightest to the Paycom team. I also focus heavily on uh, the college strategy uh, Mm -hmm. for Paycom uh, as a whole. We know that the college students are, I mean, the future. And so it's it's been really uh, a great part of, of my career. And we also focus on the strategy. So uh-huh. I also manage the strategy team in, uh, on the talent acquisition team. Okay, so needless to say, uh, we did a great job of choosing the proper guest to talk about this <laughs> here today. And guys, with that, let's kind of just jump into it. I mean, yeah. talent acquisition, such a hot topic. I mean, everywhere you go, you're reading mm-hmm. articles, it, it seems like everyone is talking about it. But right now, Tiffany, if I could start with you, you can kind of set the stage for us. Where are we right now in this market? Where has it been? Kind just give us the stage right now of of the current situation. You know, it is a very unique time. I would use the word volatile, Mm. but I also think it's somewhat sensationalized. For every article that we get from our hiring managers that talks about layoffs, we're offering candidates that have two and three Mm. unique and very competitive offers. So, For us, it is just staying very close to the candidate, understanding, you know, why are they looking and being able to differentiate Paycom. But it is a very challenging time whenever you are looking for niche, Mm. you know, very specific Mm -hmm. talent, specifically what Jenny does in the IT and technology side, but even on the sales. So it's fun. (laughs) You have to stay nimble and, you know, be able to pivot and listen very keenly to what the candidates are telling, not what the news is telling you so much and those things, but really what is going on in your market because it varies by geography as well as industry. And you said volatile. How does that compare in, in previous years? Is this kind of uncharted territory, something new for us here? It is. It, it is. You know, in COVID, our friend, COVID, <laughs> that, that opened people to thinking differently mm-hmm. about their careers and where they want to do the work and how they want to do the work. And a lot of businesses... One of the things I love about Paycom is we stayed very true to who we are. We knew what worked for us. We knew what our customers needed. And so we were very grounded and we didn't have to react. Uh, Some people may feel differently about that, but that is the biggest thing. We're Mm -hmm. seeing now those that reacted aggressively Uh in those moments, that pendulum is starting Mm -hmm. to swing back. And and we learned a lot along the way. Absolutely. And you mentioned COVID. I don't know. You guys, either whoever wants to take this one, what other factors are kind of contributing to that? Is it just COVID, the shutdown that we had, or other factors at play here as well? I think that started it. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that that's when we started to see the market shift. And I think that a lot of organizations, including Paycom, were able to identify um, specific strategies that actually worked during Mm -hmm. that period. For a lot of people, the hybrid approach or uh, being able to leverage talent across the organization without having them move to a certain location. Um, And then it it, it spread like wildfire. I think people knew that they needed to be competitive, so they started throwing in all the bells and whistles. And I think that 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 kind of started it. And some maybe overdid. Yes. You know, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. They acquired talent in the moment, but it then could they keep them? Yeah. It, it's been interesting. It's been fun, <laughs> right? But uh, it's been a journey. Yes. Yeah. 
And uh, kind of with everything that you guys have already said, I feel like we've already absorbed so much information. Uh, Jennifer, knowing the reality of the market, the, the, the situation that you guys just described, who has the leverage here? Is it the qualified candidates? Is it is it the employers? Oh, what's that looking like? And who does have the leverage here? I would say the qualified candidates. Yeah. And that's why the organizations are trying to be as competitive as they possibly can be. Mm -hmm. Tiffany mentioned this before. For every candidate that we have in the process, they're interviewing with two to three other organizations. Mm -hmm. So they truly have the choice at the tip of their fingers as far as what organization they want to be a part of. And they are truly having to search within themselves for what is important to them. And they're able to get that. Yeah. Because competition's stiff. And we're going to dig all into that. you have anything else to add yeah. about the leverage and how much they do have right now? They are, it, it is very much a candidate-driven yeah. market. And now more than ever before, it's up to the hiring managers and the organizations to be able to very clearly and truthfully articulate what they have to offer, not just from a compensation and benefits, but from a culture and, you know, how the, the inclusion piece so that they can look you in the eye and, like, do they lean into those conversations? Mm -hmm. And is it, can they call it home? Because, you know, at Paycom, we're back at work. We're yeah. in the office for the majority of our staff. Do they want to be with us? Like, are they going to have a great day each and every day? Can they feel proud about where they work? All of those mm -hmm. things matter more now than ever before. And Jennifer, I'll go to you for this one. From an application standpoint, we've talked about a lot of elements already, but from the application standpoint, what is important to those candidates right now? What's at the top of their list? Um, a major part of it is how quick it is to apply. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of these are passive candidates. They have a lot of people reaching out to them. So if it's going to take them longer than it, a few minutes in some cases, it's probably <clears throat> they're probably going to move on. Yeah. Um, another piece of that is how quickly our team responds. Um, that that is very very important, and we've actually built some processes in place to to help with that. And we could talk a little bit more about that later, mm -hmm. such as the service level agreement. But yeah. the importance of being able to give them a speedy response and selling every step of the way. Like Tiffany mentioned, our hiring managers are great. They do a great job of selling the position. But what I've uh, what we've all identified is every member of the team has to sell from beginning to end. Right. They have to put their sales cap on because it's not just the black and white, what does a job do? It's also, why do you love the job? Mm -hmm. Every step of the way so that the candidate knows that our opportunity is the best one yeah. for them. How do they manage? Mm -hmm. How will they be developed? How mm -hmm. will they, do? not just in their first 60, 90 days, but what is the ongoing? What are the career paths that you have to offer? They need to hear that over and over again and not just what's available, but how it mm -hmm. will happen because mm -hmm. uh, everybody's going to say it, but can you proof source it in the interview? And Jenny mentioned the speed. One of our recruiters attended a large um, international conference, and they uh, equated it to the red light scenario, mm -hmm. meaning everybody is on their phones. You pull in, you stop at the red light, your phone dings, and it says, oh, this the company you're interested in has a job available now. Can they show the company they're interested via quick app or whatever? Mm -hmm between the red light turning red and the red light turning green. Oh, wow. It's that fast. And that kind of leads me to exactly where I was just going to go. How important or what role does technology uh, play in the interview hiring experience? You guys have already touched on it, but can you elaborate just how important the technological aspect is? It's mission critical. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it, for us, for everyone, if you're, for those that are working at home, you know, our technology allows you, they can do interviews from their phone. They can very easily access the application. They can let us know if they're approved to move forward. They can give us feedback in the application. For the candidates, they are able to see what jobs are available. They can see if there's multiple jobs mm -hmm. that they're interested in. You know, being able to move them through that process quickly if the position is filled, you know, being able to batch edit everything so that we quickly communicate to those individuals so they're not waiting. And I can't imagine going back in the day, um, I did staffing before Paycom many moons ago. If the pace that we have to move to build Paycom, we're not maintaining, we're building mm -hmm. in a paper, uh, it I would be awful. Possible. I don't think I, I don't even do want it. to think about no. that. No, 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 not at all. And kind of sticking with the, the candidate's perspective, we talked about technology and how everything's got to be fast, fast, fast. But it kind of seems to me like, you know, going back to the leverage question we were talking about, they have all the power in a way. And we, we hear about the great resignation and everyone kind of leaving their jobs and kind of realizing, hey, the grass is greener on this side or this side. What, what's been going into that? I mean, people have talked about shifting values for employees. Mm -hmm. My question is, what are those shifting values and where did this come from? You know, 
over the last two and a half years, I think people saw the world differently. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of one person that didn't experience tragedy. Mm -hmm. And so whenever they look to the future, the prioritization is a bit different now. And being empathetic to that. But I will tell you, I mentioned before, people reacted, right? And they made aggressive switches in how they do work and where they do work. They learned from that. And what we also have seen at Paycom, and we're very blessed, we have a lot of talent coming back yeah. to us now, right? They were able to transition to a different scenario but what they realized is their values did align and it had a lot to do with the culture and the support and the love that they were shown not just through the recruitment process but through the longevity of their career but those values are more important now than ever before to understand and not just be words on a wall or on your web page but something they experience just how every day important is a company's culture when it comes to these candidates and these highly qualified candidates? Just how important is that when it comes to accepting a job? We've talked about the other, you know, monetary benefits and all of that, but how important is that culture that we're talking about? I think it's break or make. It really is because you are spending more time <clears throat> with your, your work family than you are mm -hmm. with your own family <laughs> at times. So what kind of culture do you want to surround yourself with? And when you talk about culture, that means very different things mm -hmm. to, to, to everybody. Um, to some people, it's the gym and it's the cafe. And to others, it's it's the cube and, and the people that they are surrounded with. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very important to take those things into consideration. I've been very proud of Paycom and right. the strides that we've taken to ensure that they're coming to a place that they want to be at. Right. Um, we, we talk about being better together, and we know that part of being better together is ensuring that they have that environment that they want to be a part of. Yeah, You know, our culture... I had the op opportunity to speak at a Glassdoor conference a few years ago, and it's still true today. Paycom's culture is foundational, mm -hmm. and it starts from the CEO down. It hasn't changed in the 11 years, those core pieces. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, our culture is not something we dictate. It's something we allow people to experience, and they help us create it mm -hmm. each and every day. And if you can't participate in the culture, whether it be in the cube, whether it be in the gym, whether it be in the training, whether it be in the innovation awards and giving your ideas and your voice heard and feeling respected, you're probably not going to last very long. No, no absolutely not. And, and a part of the, the good culture is trust and, and kind yes. of being up front, mm -hmm. kind of as you guys are saying, that transparency uh, factor. Jennifer, how important is transparency in terms of what it'll take to, su to succeed and do a job, you know, when you have these candidates that maybe have all these different skills and mm -hmm. jobs that require, you know, what's that one line on job applications, like other requ uh, yeah. require tasks as necessary. How important is it to be transparent with these candidates? It's an absolute necessity. As a matter of fact, when we are training our hiring managers to interview, and I know it's a philosophy Paycom uh, follows as a whole, it, we call it realistic job preview. Um, we are encouraging leaders. That's actually a requirement within your interview process. Give them the good, the bad, the ugly. We're not saying yeah. to chase them away or scare them away. It gives you the opportunity not only to highlight the positives within the organizations, but also the challenges. Uh, are you up for that challenge? Not only is that beneficial for the candidate, it's also beneficial for the for the, the organization. And it shows the candidate that you care enough, to be honest, and they can determine whether they want to be a part of that that candidate pool or not. And I think that that showcases a level of trust from the get-go that they're not just painting a picture that I want to see. Yeah. They're painting a picture that helps me decide if I want to be a part of it or not. And I think being upfront helps the employee, obviously, and the employer. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. want to mislead anybody right. and then have people sign up for something they didn't right. know they were getting into, right? Exactly. And then exactly. it's interesting talking about that. So culture and, and everything, obviously, a big deal. But, of course, money, mm -hmm. that rules the world. We know that. <laughs> From a compensation standpoint, is there a way to measure how much a candidate – I guess, would sacrifice monetarily if that potential job opportunity checks all these other boxes like culture and whatnot that we have been talking about? I don't know that there's a percentage of base salary, but we have had individuals that are willing to make a transition mm -hmm. to be part of who we are for the long term that are willing to take a short, you know, step back. That's not our preference. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something people now more than ever before you know, money is probably their three, four, yeah. five 
whenever you ask what really? is prompting you to make a job search, there are people that are out to make more money, and there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. But when it comes right down to it, dollars versus feeling confident they can have a, a career that they'll be poured into, that their voice will be heard, that they'll be entrusted with more responsibility, those rank above. Mm -hmm. Quality of life yes. is also a big factor. Yeah, and so we talked about the, the candidate's perspective and kind of what sets the stage for them. But now let's kind of get more, to even more of you guys' wool house from the recruiter's mm -hmm. perspective. Um, what do recruiters need from their employers to help navigate this market? So what could basically help them do their job to get these candidates on board? I think the first thing is acknowledging that we know that it is a different market. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a challenging market. And if they don't understand that as leadership and as an organization that we understand that what we did yesterday might not work today and what we do today might not work tomorrow. I think that's first and foremost. But I mentioned the service level agreement. That was something that our team enforced during the pandemic. Basically, we know that time is money. We know that the candidates need to hear back as soon as possible uh, for multiple reasons, out of respect, but also um, because we know they have a lot of options. And so we built a service level agreement that um, ensured that recruiters are responding timely, that hiring managers are responding timely. Once we've made an offer that the HR team is reaching out timely, um, it's providing them the support that they need to be successful yeah. in the current market. Mm -hmm. And I would say it goes initially, right? When that hiring managers are like, hmm, I have a gap. I think I need someone. Mm -hmm. What is the gap? How does that work within the team? We're fortunate we have a business partner team that helps write the job descriptions, do they really know what they want? Because the last thing in this scenario or any scenario really is to send a recruiter on a wild goose chase whenever they have many requisitions that are ready, you know, the hiring manager is dedicated, committed to have another one that puts something on their plate that they haven't done their due diligence. And when we go to market, we need to be competitive. And so our compensation team researches early mm. to know what the appropriate range we should work within. So setting them up for success, like giving them all the yeah. tools in their tool belt, as soon as we hit post and we're ready to go start those LinkedIn searches and, you know, resume database searches and cold calling, that they have everything that they need. And then to go back to what you said earlier, that when they put that candidate in front of you, that you're going to help sell them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to be honest, tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly, but then you're going to work to close them, not just expect them to close you. Right. You mentioned the, the toolbox, using the right tools. You mentioned timing, of course. That's the theme of this conversation so mm -hmm. far. And we mentioned technology and how, hey, they want to see that, that notification on their phone, mm -hmm. get it going right mm -hmm. there. How important, though, is tech for the recruiting side and how it helps them do their jobs better? Oh. <laughs> our lifeline. <laughs> the, the reactions right there are golden, <laughs> by the way. It's our lifeline. Yeah. Right. Can you imagine if we didn't have a scheduling tool or – uh, an applicant tracking system no. that didn't allow us to disposition or send messages um, that allowed us to go back and track right. it. I don't know that we could do our jobs yeah. as efficiently no. and as effectively as we need to. And the thousands of students we meet at the colleges, if we couldn't go back, tag them and write. Right. <laughs> it's a must have. Yes. Yeah. I'll just say that. It is an absolute must have. So with, with all the, this information and, mm -hmm. and data, how important that is, knowing who to go after, when, and all of this, uh, what type of data do recruiters need to access or, or need to access to do their jobs effectively? So it kind of goes in part with technology, but what information do they need to be brought, I guess, to their phones or their computers mm -hmm. to get this, you know, more of a, an efficient process, so to speak? We live off of data. Mm -hmm. um, data, I mean, as, as soon as we get a new role, we have members of the team that does a quick market analysis and then continued data review on um, time to fill, for instance, is, is a major part of that. Um, also, at every part of the interview process, where are we losing candidates? Why? We're able to dig into that. Uh, we're able to dig into um, if it, how long did it take so to get someone into the seat? Mm. Um, and, and we are allowed at that point to stack hands with different areas of the business to ensure that if there are gaps, that we have opportunities to enhance mm -hmm. that. Um, but I, I would say that data is, is really the primary function of our job right. is reviewing the data. Yeah, and it takes that feeling out of mm -hmm. it and you can have very structured conversations because in in any market but especially as tight as the labor market is today hiring managers are fearful and rightfully yeah. so right they have their task they have their objective and if they don't have the talent to execute 
it's scary. And so sometimes those conversations come with emotion. And so when the recruiter, we have what we call our recruiting strategy meetings, our RSMs, we're able to bring this intelligence to them and it calms them, right? Perhaps you haven't made a hire in the last 30 days, but let us show the efforts that we've been taking. These are the tools that we're utilizing. This is the These are the results. This is the feedback we've gotten from the marketplace. And then sometimes we go back to our, our business partners and our compensation team and say, hey, we're not able to move the needle here. We may need to revisit this. And then we start the search over and typically fill it very quickly. Mm-hmm. But without the data, it would just be us saying it's hard. Yes. Yeah. You know, and that's not what anybody wants to hear. So I'm hearing it seems like a lot of trial and error as we, you know, we mentioned the, the post-COVID or we're still in it, you know, moving away from that and the changes that have come from that. How much trial and error is it? I mean, you go into the drawing board a lot. Is that getting in the way of actually doing your jobs from a recruiting standpoint, figuring out what works, figuring out what you need? What is that process like for you guys? Definitely trial and error, but I I will say um, I think Tiffany would agree. Uh, we 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 had to try things we never tried before, mm-hmm. and we were like, this is actually a lot more effective and efficient <laughs> yeah. than what we used to do. For instance, um, our team, you know, we're heavily involved in college initiatives, and we used to go to every college campus, and we used to have our technical experts go and do a presentation. Where now we do a virtual showcase. Mm-hmm. Hit all universities at one go. This is the night. Um, we Our did summer s- engagement program. Summer yeah. engagement program. We had eighty-five plus tech interns ready to join the team, and unfortunately, they couldn't because of the situation. So immediately, Brad Smith, the CIO, and and the technical leaders, we all kind of band together and said, "Hey, they already committed to join the team. Why don't we set a program where?" Whether they, they're they not going to get paid for it because, unfortunately, they can't join the team, but let's give them the knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so they were able to teach them about programming languages. They were able to not only get insight on technical initiatives, but, hey, is this the team that I want to be a part of? Um, so that worked for us. That's been so successful. We've been able to expand it to um, – our sales organization. Mm -hmm. And so now it's a feeder Mm -hmm. into the internship. So we've been able to go deeper Mm -hmm. into the university talent to one of the freshmen, sophomore. And so we offer this free summer program where we teach them. We talk about coding languages. Mm -hmm. We teach sales tips and tricks. I had the opportunity yesterday to talk about like self-motivation and how, you know, leveraging inspiration to to go forward and, and how you inspire and motivate your team and others around you. So we're pouring into them, you know, Pay it forward, yes. right? Yeah. We hope that they are given the opportunity to work for us full time. But if not, if they're Paycom advocates and they understand what we do, then that's a win as well. Yeah. And that all was a brainchild that we had to be creative and we're keeping it, yes. right? That's not something we did as a reaction. We created it and yeah. now we're sustaining it. Mm-hmm. The, the look in you guys' face is uh, when I asked that question, kind of lit up a little bit. And this kind of goes back to the first question What's the market like? You said volatile, but then you go fun. Is this the fun part you guys mm-hmm. are kind of talking about? Yeah. yeah. Creative solutions is a big part of our job. Right. And so it was, it, although it was stressful at the time because it was a whole new world, it did give us an opportunity to kind of recreate how we do things and our approach. And we said trial and error. We had some wins, but we also had some losses. We tried some <laughs> campaigns. We tried yeah. some reach. Didn't work. But we got a lot of wins out of it. And I think for me personally in my career, it was a challenge that I never had to confront before. And we overcame it. And it was one of the major wins in my career. Um, so I will say it, it was exciting. Yeah. Same for you. I love it each and every day. And, you know, you never let go of the basics because if you do, then that's where you, yeah. you're like, hmm, we have waned too far. Yeah. So there's there's the foundational, you know, back to the basics. Jenny teaches it. Mm-hmm. Um, but to layer on top of that, the creativity and the chance to try mm-hmm. and the fear of failure, but then mm-hmm. the thrill of the win. The excitement I mean, we're it. very yeah. competitive. Mm-hmm. Figuring it out and getting right? it done. You know? Like yeah. that's just who we are at Paycom. I mean, one of our core values is winning, yeah. right? Yeah. So when we win, we get really excited. And it has been, I mean, I've our team is phenomenal. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that, I see the fun and I see all of that. Going back to the word of the day, aside from, I guess, timing and technology, uh, mm-hmm. volatility as well. Uh, as we wind down, I want to hear from both of you on on this last one here. Uh, how long, I guess, will this heated market last? I mean, do you guys have predictors that can kind of tell you, hey, maybe two years, three years, five years? How long is this kind of volatile, fun landscape going to be here? 
I have no idea. Like Do you to have a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bad question. We're gonna cut this no. one out for you guys. No, it's a good one. I will no. say this. Tiffany mentioned this earlier. You know, um, hiring managers. I mean, they just like us. They want to know what's happening in the market, so they'll send us articles on. Hey, we're seeing that organizations are starting to lay off. We're seeing that organizations are pulling back on pay. We have not necessarily seen the difference mm -hmm. with our candidate pool. They are still, it's still mm -hmm. very competitive. They still have plenty of options. Um, but we are seeing changes in the industry. Mm -hmm. Other organizations, not necessarily um, the ones that affect our uh, core uh, candidate pool, but I, I would assume that it's getting closer and closer um, to a lot of technology companies now are saying, hey, we're actually reassessing the pay range. Uh, companies that actually added on recruiting teams because they were going to hire have mm. actually laid off mm. uh, not only the recruiting team but multiple members of their team and so where everyone was thinking big to tiffany's point how sustainable is that yeah. um so only time will tell right we're hearing things we haven't felt it yet I tiffany would agree. you get the crystal ball for us <laughs> what's your prognostication for us um very <laughs> similar to jenny's i think just staying in tune um don't sensationalize one article yeah. or one newscast, but really listen. Listen deeply for the emotions behind it and then back it up with the, the facts and then know your market, know your company. Mm -hmm. Because just because they are doing it this way, just because they are experiencing something doesn't mean that it's going to affect you the same way. And know who you are, know what your budget is, know what your strategy will be, be willing to pivot and tweak and try something new and exciting. But as soon as we get over this, guys, something else is yeah. going to hit yeah. us, right? Like there's been ebbs and flows throughout and just seek first to understand and then build your strategy to react and react quickly, but don't overreact. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you for a great answer. I know you can't <laughs> predict the future, but you guys handled that one <laughs> very well. Um, and as we wind down, I know you guys are very busy. want to get you out of here. Uh, one last question. And really just kind of setting the stage for you guys again. What's one thing that you want the listeners or viewers out there to know about the world of talent acquisition? I know we covered a lot of stuff, but if you could put a bow on it for us, and uh, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you have for the listeners out there? Yeah, if, if we're talking to the talent acquisition team, I like you mentioned before, there is an exciting element of switching strategy and trying things you've never tried before, but also sticking with it. Um, the market's going to yeah. consistently change. If you feel like you're not getting wins right now, keep doing what you're doing. Try new things. Um, I do think that we're going to see changes. Like Tiffany said, it's inevitable. It's going to continue to happen. Lean in to the yeah. to the strengths that you have and, and, and try your best. Yeah. And I would just say the best recruiters in the world – ask great questions. Mm -hmm. That's kind of that back to the basics. Never lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself doing all the talking, you know, telling what you think is happening, yeah. telling, then you miss the mark. So always ask great questions and be a great listener. I'm hoping I could do a little bit of that right here on these podcasts. Ask great questions. <laughs> and listen, great. I try my best. I try my best. But no, uh, we really do appreciate you, uh, Tiffany, Jennifer, uh, so much good stuff uh, from this conversation. And uh, hey, we're in-house. Hopefully we can have you guys on again in the future. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Yes. Thank you, guys. Be sure to follow and subscribe to HR Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. For more episodes, visit hrbreakroom.com or follow us on social media. Thanks for tuning in to this episode, and we can't wait for you to join us again inside the HR break room.